from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and ahead today, K-State's Walt Fick will be with us to go over the latest strategies for controlling musk thistle in pasture areas. He says this next month or so is an ideal time for spraying those thistle rosettes. He'll go over the herbicide choices that get the job done, including those with residual activity into the springtime. Then a segment of this week's Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber will take a close look at achieving target breeding weights for replacement heifers and what daily rates of gain are necessary to accomplish that. And further ahead, with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, plus more right here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Thanks for being along with us for this Agriculture Today. On our first segment, we'll take up a long-standing concern in our grasslands around Kansas, and its presence is still felt out there. It's a noxious weed that we know very well, musk thistle. The fall is an excellent time to control it with various means, and we'll cover the possibilities there now with Walt Fick joining us. Range and Pasture Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and an old hand at dealing with musk thistle questions and issues, Walton. Its range has spread in recent years. Where do we stand on musk thistle invasion in our grasses now? Well, I think if you were to look, nearly every county in the state of Kansas has musk thistle. I think some of the, the later surveys might show a county here or there that doesn't have it, but I think it's, it's pretty widespread and has been for a number of years now. And is extremely competitive with our grasses, our native grasses in particular, right? It's, it's quite competitive. You know, it does have a, a tap root, which allows it to, to extract water from maybe deeper depths even than most of our grasses. But it's got a sufficient enough uh, fibrous root system. It's pretty competitive. You know, I've done work in the past. Oh, a couple thistles per square foot. Uh, you can reduce forage production about 50%. And it spreads so readily, uh, largely by seed. It's prolific in that sense, right? Yeah, it spreads strictly by, by seed. It's, you know, primarily a biennial or, or a winter annual. Those type of plants just, just reproduce by seed. And, oh, a good size uh, musk thistle plant might produce, well, several thousand, maybe 10,000 seeds in an individual plant. So it only takes one to replace that plant that produced it. So there's plenty of seed. So the fall is an excellent time to get a hold of musk thistle and control it. And this has been researched thoroughly throughout the many years, has it not, Walt? Yeah, I've worked on it for, you know, probably 40 years now and off and on. And, uh, yeah, I like the fall because of two or three reasons. It's the plants are all rosettes. Uh, That's, you know, they haven't molded yet or gone to flower, so they're, they're more susceptible to herbicide in that stage. Plus, we have a usually, if, you know, unless winter sets in too quickly, we have a, a bigger window of opportunity for treating. You know, the months of October, November, uh, and even into early December, some years we can get pretty good control. Uh, the other advantage is you don't have to worry quite so much about drift onto, you know, susceptible crops. You know, when we're talking about fall. And we didn't mention this earlier, but it's worth plugging in. Because of our wet fall and now warm conditions, musk thistle can really gain a toehold in a lot of places. Uh, Those are conditions under which musk thistle is apt to germinate. It'll germinate in in the spring, you know, with moisture as things warm up. But fall is also a time and, you know, there's hardly any significant drought going on right now in Kansas anymore. So we've Pretty much the whole state has received good precipitation. Uh, warm weather, you know, it's been 60, 70 degrees. Uh, uh, must this will definitely 
germinate under those conditions. Before we talk about herbicide alternatives that have proven in K-State field trials to be the most effective against musk thistle, the recent freezes we had in Kansas, did they affect that rosette growth to the point where that might impede their uptake of herbicides? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's it's we had some temperatures, well, depending where you're at in the state, but yeah, there were some freezing temperatures, but you know, I've treated as late as December, well after killing frost, and the thistles still have some green tissue in them. So it's going to take in a lot more severe weather than we've had at this point to shut those plants down. So the opportunity remains. Preferred herbicide treatments. We have some old standbys. There have been uh, new chemistry options come along. What do your field trials tell us to the moment on that? I think over the, the years, and, and again, a little different conditions maybe this year, but a lot of times when we have either dry soil conditions and or colder temperatures, then some of the old products like 2,4-D low volatile ester works about as well as any of them. You know, a quart and a half, two quarts of that product. Picloram, as, as we have in Tordon 22K, uh, is also excellent. Eight, uh, maybe 10 fluid ounces of that product has also been uh, very good under a number of different years treatment in the fall. Uh, and then a relatively new product, although it's been around a few years now, is a product called Milestone. Amino pyrolid is the chemical in that product. Oh, about four fluid ounces. I think the labeled rate will say three to five. I found that four seems to work quite well. It also has some advantages. Both the, the Milestone and, and Tordon both have some residual activity. You know, with a later fall application, you know, late November, early December, I've seen those products carry over the next spring and not have any new seedlings emerge. Enough of that chemical still in the soil to take care of those new plants as well. And that's a plus, absolutely. Yeah. So it not only gets the ones you treated at, you know, in, in the fall, but you'll have some residual activity. Now, 2,4-D, for instance, doesn't do that. I can kill existing plants in the fall quite well, but uh, the next year, by you know, summertime, you'll see plenty of new rosettes that came up in the spring. And when you say control, your trials have illustrated that as much as 100% control can be attained? Yes, you know, under under ideal conditions, or maybe not even under ideal, but, yeah, with those, the Tordon and 2,4-D low volatile ester and Milestone have all given excellent control. You know, it may not always be 100%, but you're going to get get the majority and the way I usually rate those is, is when I treat in the fall, I'll go back and look, like, say, the next summer after plants have, have bolted. And those plots uh, generally don't have any bolted plants because if they, those rosettes were present in the fall, they go through the winter and they bolt the next year. They're acting as a winter annual. Or they possibly could have been a biennial, you know, that germinated sometime the previous growing season. But they're going to bolt the next year. And if they aren't there, well, that tells me i got excellent control. And there is this fairly wide window of treatment opportunity by the label and by the weather conditions. Anytime this next month or so, in fact, would one want to wait and make sure the rosettes have a time to fully emerge and then assure that they get full control? I think you have a window of opportunity for, for a month or so. We haven't seen it for a while. There's There's been years when I've seen some of our coldest temperatures in early to mid-November, I mean, single digits. And, you know, that's probably going to shut down plants quite a bit if that occurs. So I, you know, don't know whether that occur, but actually if you get a, a good hard freeze, uh, I think, again, if the plants still have some green, you have an opportunity to, to get absorption of these herbicides. But after a, a major freeze, I might wait, a, oh, a few days, you know, and you get a nice sunny day again. I think I would go ahead and, and try to treat because I think you'll get good results that way. And, of course, the options for control have been uh, documented in the K-State field trials. You can inquire about that information at your local extension office. I want to mention one more thing before you go. There has been the alternative of biological control of musk thistle introduced over the years past. Is that still in the mix here as far as controlling this weed, Walt? Well, I think there's plenty of uh, musk thistle head weevil in particular. There's also a rosette weevil. Uh, the rosette weevil hasn't seemed to have survived maybe quite as well, but I think you can still find both of those weevils uh, throughout much of the state. I know I've seen them in 
north central Kansas as well as the eastern part of the state. You know, if they're present, they're, they're helping reduce seed production, and that's going to be beneficial. Obviously, it hasn't eliminated musk thistle. We still have, you know, from year to year, several hundred thousand acres, they estimate, that are, that are infested with musk thistle. But I think the weevils have helped uh, reduce seed production. I don't seem to see the, the real dense stands that I used to see, for instance, and I think they've had a, the weevil has helped in that regard. Oh, occasionally maybe you, you'll get a pond dam or something that's, you know, a lot of bare ground and you can see a pretty thick stand. But just out in, in the sod, even in low-lying areas and pastures, you usually don't see, you know, where it's so thick the animals won't walk into it anyway. Mm-hmm. So I think the weevil has helped. The downside has been is because the the head weevil has been sh- shown to also attack some of our uh, uh, cercium type species that are particularly a, an endangered species, I think primarily that grows in Nebraska in terms of this part of the, the U.S. Uh, they've seen it on that plant, and consequently they've restricted use now in terms you aren't supposed to, to transport the uh, head weevils across state lines. Mm-hmm. But if you have it already in the state, and it's, it's out there, or if your neighbor has it and is willing to share with you some weevils, you know, that's, that's fine. You can still use those. I think you want to pick the areas that you use them, you know, maybe an undisturbed site because we've seen that disturbance, you know, whether it's man's activities or, or even grazing animals. If they're around, the weevils tend to get up and move. You won't get a high enough population to do a very good job. But uh, if you have areas that, that are somewhat protected, uh, those would be a place I, where I would consider putting weevils if I can get them. They are contributors, but they do not preclude the need in so many of these more intense invaded areas to uh, use chemical control. And there are options to certainly consider here. And those are, by the way, featured in a write-up on fall musk thistle control that you can find in one of the recent Agronomy e-update newsletters. It was dated October the 12th at agronomy.ksu.edu. It's a timely word, as always, Walt, and thank you for coming over. Thanks, Eric. Walt Fick with us, Range and Pasture Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today. Welcome back. And for you now, another segment from the most recent Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. The team of BCI researchers get together every week to talk about contemporary topics in cattle production and management. And around the table this week, K-State veterinarians Bob Larson and Brad White and cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. And here's Brad to lead the discussion. One of the things that we wanted to talk about today was spend a fair bit of time on replacement heifers. So we talked about it a little bit last week. Okay, I'm going to wean my heifers this fall. What rate of gain should I have? And I'm going to hold you guys to your your quotes. Last week, Bob Weber said they should gain a pound and a quarter or so between weaning and breeding. And Bob Larson said, eh, about eight-tenths of a pound. So now I'm going to ask you to back up your statement a little bit and one of you i know has done some math one of you has just solidified your opinions with with no no math math. yeah Yeah. it it, it turns out if you do the math we're both wrong (laughs) okay (laughs) um and we're both low um so i I did a little uh as as you suggest a little math here this morning and and here's closer to 1.5 yeah my my assumptions were okay we got 1400 pound cows which is kind of the average body condition score five mature cow body weight in kansas i said conservatively let's say the calves weigh five and a half for heifers Mm -hmm. um which probably is maybe on the little on the light end but given the drought and stuff we had this year it's probably pretty close 
And so then I did uh, I did the math, and from uh, weaning to breeding, so I figured these were March calvers, which means we'd breed them first part of June as a target. That means between weaning and breeding, the 65%, which was my vote, uh, of mature weight um, at breeding time, that's about 210 days away, means they need to gain about 1.7 to gain 360 pounds, so 550 to 910. 910 was the target. On the 55 target that means those heifers weigh about 770 at breeding time first of june Um, they have to gain about 1.1 per day Uh, they need to gain 220 pounds in 210 days and so when you're when you're saying 55 target tell me a little bit more about what you're what are you saying there so the 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 target's 55 percent of their expected mature weight at so, breeding. So, which is why you said a, a 1,400-pound cow, 55% of that yeah. at breeding, or 65% of that was your other assumption? That they weighed 1,400 pounds. Yeah, yeah those, are, those are really the two numbers that people throw out. And, yeah. and to be honest, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with my recommendation, but I understand where both those numbers come from. If you want to be sure that, like, if you start with 50 heifers or 75 heifers, and you want to be sure that a lot of them reach puberty and are ready to breed, then if you target, you know, 65% of mature weight, for the herd average and kind of use that to plan a ration, most of those heifers will reach puberty and, and have a good chance to get pregnant early in the breeding season. There's another school of thought, though, that says we might want to put some selection pressure on those cows that, that reach puberty a little bit earlier. And it might be because they have a smaller mature weight or that they just do reach puberty earlier. But to put selection pressure on them means that uh, I'm going to go for a lower rate of gain, aim for 55% of their mature weight, by the time we breed them, but then I'm going to have a bunch of heifers that don't don't yeah, reach. There's going to be fallout. Right? There's going to be fallout, and yeah. so you can't have both. You can't put selection pressure on for earlier puberty and expect them to all reach puberty. And and there's ranchers that take both opinions or somewhere in the middle. And I think there's reasons to do that, but I think it needs to be thought through well exactly what you want to accomplish. And I do like putting a little bit of selection pressure on commercial heifers, particularly. Yep. Maybe 65 is giving them not enough selection pressure some could argue that 55 is too much selection pressure but i'm going to stick with that for now but you have less less margin for error you do and that's the other thing you do have less margin for error on a on a year where your forage quality isn't good or weather is more of a a factor it may be harder to get my 0.9 or 1 or 1.1 pounds a gain a day with the forages and ration that i had planned because a, a higher rate of gain i'm going to use more concentrates and they're more predictable than my forages are Refresh me on the numbers again. So for the 65% of their mature body weight, 1,400 pounds, what, what do they need to gain per day? You've they got 210 one, days? 1.7. 1. 1.7 1. 7 Versus 1.1. 1. 1. Okay. So that's that's if we have 210 days. So yeah. if we wait and don't make our ration and we wean them and kind of let them hang out for a while, get yeah, adjusted, and we don't start this for the next 60 days – they will have gained maybe a little bit, but a lot of times those calves, even if they stay on the cow, they're not, they're not gaining much between yeah. now and mid-December. Right. We lost 60 days. Yeah. Now we're talking about... Which is roughly a third of the time period. So now you're so, up to two and a half, two and a quarter yeah, two, anyway. two and a quarter and pushing probably one four or one five. So, yeah, it, time really makes a big difference in one, in these. So the, day, the days that you have. So planning that now, and one of the points is... Come up with your target breeding weight, whether it's the 65 or the 55 percent mm-hmm. of their mature body weight. Have an idea of what your cows weigh, because I think your estimate of 1,400 pounds is great. That's not what I see most people use. I see most people say my cow weighs 1,200 pounds, and I think that some of those may be right, but many of them are it's, underestimated. And yeah, they're often underestimated. That there's pretty good data to support that the average cow weighs 1400 or more Mm -hmm. um in kansas and so the risk is if you think you've got 1200 pound cows you probably better collect some data to prove that because if you under guess that and do the 55 endpoint to bob now i'm really getting now i'm really at risk because i'm not at 55 i'm at 50 or 45 percent of your weight and, and not very many are going to reach people which right. is another reason to shoot maybe a little higher right so we don't know our you know our one other thing and i'll throw it at, at dr weber over here is there's been some work showing that there's some value in having heifers learn to graze though during this time right. frame and so my preference would be even if i am bringing some supplement out there to get them to gain 1.7 or 2 i'd really like to do that on a on a grazing situation rather than a dry lot that may not be available for everybody. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I like that. And, and I think, you know, from a cost standpoint, 
you know, sometimes it's a push between, you know, providing that kind of higher concentrate feed out on pasture. And, and there's some good strategies to do that. You know, a lot of times a distiller's product will work pretty good, feed it every other day and just meet the protein requirement of those heifers. And you can get them to gain a pound a day um, on standing dry forage. So there's there's some really good opportunities to sort of capitalize on some of those commodity or co-products to, to make that happen uh, in a pasture setting. But they're not small cows. They're no. heifers. I mean, sometimes you, they're, they're teenagers. you're talking about they're, heifers like, oh, they're small cows. We're going to teach them to graze. We're going to do some of these things. They're not small cows. They're growing animals, yep. and they're different than our – So, and maybe what we ought to do is bring – Dr. Olson's done some actual, yeah. actual, actual yeah. work on this and, and you know, weaning heifers and then kicking them back with the cows for the fall. Yeah. And if you're in a situation where you've got to do some and, and should do some protein supplementation to grazing cows to get some body condition score back – you know, leaving those uh, replacement candidates side by side with their dams after they've been weaned, kicked back out, um, and provide that supplementation on pasture to make sure that they're gaining, you know, one or one, two a day can be a pretty good strategy. The the other piece, though, is um, we haven't changed our sort of target at calving, right? I, st- so I still want her 85. 85, and that's, I think, one so. of the things sometimes we don't think about, okay, what's the gain on the rest of the period between breeding and calving have to be? And one of the things we find is that those uh, lower targeted uh, body weights at breeding, they've got more ground to cover no, between be breeding and calving and uh, um, by a, about 140, 150 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you look at the, the gain requirement between breeding and calving, um, the targeted 55% of body weight, those cows or heifers have to gain one one a day to meet their 1,190 pounds. So that's 85% of 1,400 target weight at calving. The point or the 65% uh, targeted heifers at breeding have to gain about 0.9 pounds per yeah. day over that same so a little bit of time. over or under a pound a day which can be important particularly based on forage quality yeah and again green growing forage they'll do that kind of gain easily easily but most uh, with spring calving herds most of that time is going to be on dormant forage and so whether it's harvested forage or standing forage some of that isn't going to really have the quality to get me up to a pound a day I, unless i do yeah. a little bit of supplementation if they don't if they don't hit that 85 percent what's the downside what's the so you're saying 85 percent of their mature body weight at the time they have that first calf yep how big a deal is that yeah so that was uh about 1.35 gain for the low ones 0.92 for the uh, 0.65s the risk of not hitting that is Potentially heifers in not very good body condition score at calving. So we have calving difficulty. Calving difficulty. So calf dystocia, loss. calf loss. I think probably the bigger issue is if they're in low body condition score at breeding, they're, not, they're lactating, they're two year olds, they're they got two primary again. incisors. Yeah, they're um, not going to cycle. They're not going to cycle and rebreed. So, and it's, so the, it's the breed back. You'll, they'll have a longer postpartum interval. I think there's a number well, of bad things because I do yeah. think you'll see a lot more. First of all, just calving difficulty, but even some of those weak calves, calves that don't get off to a good start. Yep. And then I think a lot of those first calf heifers, those cows that are suckling their first calf, uh, if they calve thin, they, they really struggle to get bred within the next 100 days. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah either they're open or they're late breads and, you know, your calf momentum idea yeah, is pretty well window. shot to yeah. Hades, right? So yeah. um, the, the consequence of, of not making sure those heifers get to that body weight is, is I think, the biggest risk. Well, maybe. And one of the things that if you're going to do the lower body weight, you need some checkpoints in the system to weigh those right. heifers and make sure you're on target and adjust supplementation if you need to to make sure that they're where they need to be at I think that's time. a great point. And next week, we'll finish this discussion on replacement heifers. Look forward to visiting with you next week. K-State's Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber. Hear the entire BCI Cattle Chat podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org. This is Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
This is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here as we continue on now with today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, a Northern California judge has upheld a jury's verdict that found glyphosate caused a groundskeeper's cancer, but she slashed the amount of punitive damages to be paid from $289 million down to $78 million. In denying Monsanto's request for a new trial, San Francisco Superior Court Judge Suzanne Bolanos cut the jury's punitive damage award from $250 million down to $39 million. The judge had earlier said she had strong doubts about the jury's entire punitive damage award. Bolanos gave Dwayne Johnson until December the 7th to accept that reduced amount or demand a new trial. Now, Monsanto spokesperson Daniel Child said that the company was pleased with the reduced reward, but still planned to appeal the verdict. Bolano said it appeared that jurors overreached with their punitive damages award. She said then that she was considering wiping out the $250 million judgment entirely after finding no compelling evidence presented at trial that Monsanto employees ignored evidence that the weed killer caused cancer. The judge reversed course and said she was compelled to honor the jurors' conclusions after they listened to expert witnesses for both sides debating the merits of Johnson's claim. Johnson's law lawsuit is among hundreds alleging Roundup causes cancer. It was the first one to go to trial. Many in the scientific community, as well as government regulators, have refuted any link between glyphosate and cancer, and Monsanto has vehemently denied such a connection, saying that hundreds of studies have established that glyphosate is safe. Trade policy actions by President Trump have started to bear fruit, and that has prompted Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa to shift his views on the administration's trade actions. Quoting him, quite frankly, we thought they did not know what they were doing. He went on to tell reporters, now it looks like things are coming together, in his words. The U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement and updated South Korea trade deal are two of the factors contributing to Grassley's change of heart. He said until the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, there was a doubt about whether the president could really pull it off, as he said. Now that he has succeeded, he thinks it reinforces the fact that producers are going to stick with the president. He shared this in his weekly call with reporters. Grassley went on to say the USMCA deal could be a key for pork, corn, and soybeans. Nothing special in regard to Canada, but the fact that we got an agreement with Canada means we can move along with our agreement with Mexico. And he notes that Mexico is the number one buyer of our corn and also a large buyer of our pork. There are scores of regulatory issues being opened up by the cultured meat products being developed. Stakeholders in these products are in Washington this week to talk about those issues. And here's more from the USDA's Gary Crawford on that. Here at Agriculture Department headquarters in Washington this week. What we're trying to accomplish here today is to frame how the new technology of cell cultured meat is regulated by the federal government. Throughout this process, FDA is committed to working with USDA and with you to determine the most effective regulatory oversight framework for these novel products. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue, FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, opening up two days of meetings here with hundreds of people with a stake in that fast-approaching new food technology of growing meat products in labs from cells. These new products may be ready for the market in a year or two, and so developers will need ahead of time all of the safety and inspection rules and regulations, rules that Sonny Perdue said should be clear, concise, and and easily to be complied with. But regulatory efficiencies won't come at the expense of consumer safety. Lots of issues to be decided here. One big one, as far as livestock producers are concerned, is what to call these new products, should they even be called meat. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, the beef industry recently introduced its own artificial intelligence personality to the public. Todd Domer tells us here that consumers have now the ability to ask Chuck... There are questions about beef and how it's produced. The newest addition to the Beef It's What's for Dinner brand family, Chuck Knows Beef, will be on display November 29th at the Kansas Livestock Association Convention in Wichita. Season Solorio, Senior Executive Director of Brand Marketing for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff, will demonstrate Chuck Knows Beef during the Consumer Trends Forum sponsored by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Powered by Google Artificial Intelligence, 
Chuck is the consumer's guide to all things beef, including thousands of checkoff recipes, cooking tips, cut information, and more. Consumers can ask, what can I make with flank steak? Or how do ranchers take care of the environment? Or how do you check the internal cooking temperature of a Chuck roast? Chuck will answer these and other consumer questions with customized responses based on content from BeefIt'sWhat'sForDinner.com. As questions are asked, Chuck is updated and improved to provide the best answers and user experience. It is accessible through both mobile devices and desktop. Consumers can simply click on the banner on the Beef It's What's For Dinner homepage or go directly to chuckknowsbeef.com and either speak or type their questions. The launch for Chuck Knows Beef was October 3rd. I'm Todd Domer. And Australia may be tracking toward its smallest winter grain crop in a decade as extremely dry weather and damaging frost take their toll. Rabobank is estimating a national harvest of just 29 million metric tons for the 1819 winter. That would be 23 percent below last season's total and would come amid what's expected to be one of the worst ever winters for eastern Australia. Were it not for better harvest prospects in western Australia, that's the only state forecasted to see in increased output. The country could be facing its lowest winter crop in 20 years, according to the bank. It adds this coming season is slated to be the first time in two decades that Western Australia would contribute more than half of the national winter crop. Bank expects to see record Australian grain prices holding well into 2019. And we do want to remind you once again that U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue will be the next speaker in K-State's Land and Lecture Series. That is set for 10.30 in the morning, a week from tomorrow, Thursday, November the 1st, in McCain Auditorium. That lecture, free and the public is invited. It will center on the Secretary's life growing up on his family farm and what he learned about family, school, church, sports, and caring for the land and animals, forming a foundation of his career of service to the industry. The secretary will be the 179th speaker and the 11th secretary of agriculture to take part in that lecture series. If you're in or around the Manhattan area during that time, please stop in and take in that lecture. 1030 in the morning, Thursday, November the 1st, McCain Auditorium, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, presenting the latest land and lecture here at K-State. We'll be back with more. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. I am bombarded with travel information. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. On the one hand, but then on the other hand. It was my brother-in-law in the Netherlands who forced the issue on my thinking when he said during a recent phone conversation, we are not going anywhere. We're staying home. I don't want to keep adding to air pollution by traveling. The way he said it, I knew he meant it. Of course, in the Netherlands, small country that it is, one does not have to travel very far to visit or just be gone. However, with the open borders, one is in Germany or Belgium before you know it. But he was staying home, no polluting that weekend. That made me think hard, and I don't have an answer. On the one hand, but there is the other hand. If you accept that by going places we pollute and become part of climate change, then I ask, what about the economics of traveling and the joy of seeing new places or just being away from home? 
I am bombarded with travel information, the top 20 list of places to go, the best from 2,000 companies. Remember, I'm talking about recreational traveling. The push for mobility by Henry Ford, the man of the Model T. The camping trips we have taken with the growing family were in the tradition of the open road. But I've looked up in the evening sky and counted the vapor trails spreading, nearly forming a solid vapor cloud of overcast. I've looked at schematics of air traffic across the Atlantic Ocean or the Big Pond and thought, wow, that's a lot of people going places. Yes, some for business and other just for pleasure. They've watched Rick Stevens' Keep on Traveling TV presentation. And there are other travel enthusiasts encouraging or enticing us to go and visit places and consequently pollute. It's a problem, on the one hand. But then, on the other hand, I believe in traveling and seeing places. Even more so, I believe in living in the other places so that you learn what life is like over there. And as I've said before, I've done it. Together with my wife, I've hosted garden tours in Europe. We visit beautiful gardens and historic places. So keep on traveling, like Rick Stevens and the others. It's good for the economy, and it should help us to understand people who think differently. But we will be polluting one way or another. Just think about the plastic issue. Yet, it's all good for the economy. Many people find employment in the tourism industry. There's professionalism at many levels, directing and building up the industry. And it seems some societies have given its people more leisure time. So what are you going to do? It's the other hand. The Manhattan Mercury has articles on places to travel to. I already mentioned there is the TV with enticing programs. I should have watched last week's Travelscape, Joseph visiting the Peruvian Amazon. By watching it on TV, I'm not as destructive as I would be going there. How can we save the Amazon by traveling down there and seeing the devastation, the clearing and the creation of more arable land and cattle ranches? As an attraction, what about the remaining Amazon indigenous people, the few remaining? They do not need to see us. On the other hand, might we be learning when we see what we have destroyed? I say we here as we of this world. The expression world citizens is sometimes used. It can become overwhelming if you really sit down and think hard about it. I hear my brother-in-law say, I'm staying home, and in no way is he a recluse. If I look at my family, they travel. One grandson works in the travel industry, and he loves it. That's the job, but also the travel. I can't stop them, and I won't, even if I, for other reasons, on the other hand, may not go overseas anymore. I surely hope my daughter will come and visit us and crosses the pond. I can't even tell you right now how many times I myself or members of the family have crossed the pond by ship or airplane. And I'm not counting the Pacific going down under. I'm guilty. I'm sure there will be innovations in planes and cars which will produce less pollution. But just as sure as I am of that, there will be more people and more traveling and hitting the road. The debate of climate change will go on. For me, it's a fact. Now what all causes it, it may be just a slow cycle between another ice age. Maybe the slow movement of the glaciers and the ice starts coming south could be another tourist attraction. It surely will be an economic boost. Ecotourism will be a great adventure. 
the beans and other stores and other catalogs for extra tough and warm clothing would be a bestseller. I wonder where the sweaters, socks, jackets and vests would be made. China? Ah, it's a long time off. It won't happen this weekend. Not in my lifetime. But what about the little Vanderhovens, born and not yet born? Maybe we need to start looking at things closer to home, so-called destination attractions. And maybe we can develop them at a high level to satisfy our wanderlust. Maybe. This morning, the moon over Kansas looked beautiful. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.